in this series. Um, and always just wonderful to see, you know, we send these things out in the world, we never know who's going to actually come in the room. So thank you all for coming out um, at this, for many people, a very busy time of year. Uh, so my name is Amy Starczewski. I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program here at Columbia. Um, and tonight's event is the kickoff for a year-long series on the topic of oral history and the future, archives and embodied memory. Um, you like it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more abstract. You know, we've done like oral history in the arts, or oral history in the city, or oral history and health and medicine. Um, this one's a little bit more abstract. Um, and it comes from the idea that oral history is a conversation about the past that's happening in the present and that's oriented towards the future. Um, and I think that this is hopefully going to be a year-long interesting space to think about what are the different ways that we make that future orientation real. Uh, sometimes we put our things into an archive. What are the structures that support that archive and make it function as a place where people actually can go and use things? Sometimes we tell our stories to another person and expect that they're then going to tell it to another person tell it to their children, to pass it on from person to person through embodied memory. And sometimes we're doing both of those things together in really complicated ways, uh, partially because of the precarity of digital and institutional and quasi-institutional archives. Um, so actually, it was conversations with Maria and encountering her work that started me thinking about some of these questions. And I'm just absolutely thrilled that she was able and willing to make the trip from Michigan to talk with us tonight. Uh, Maria Cotera is an assistant professor in the Department of Women's Studies and American Culture at the University of Michigan, where she also directs the Latino uh, Studies program. Her first book, Native Speakers, Ella Deloria, Zora Neale Hurston, Jovita Gonzalez, and the Politics of Culture received the Gloria Anzaldúa Book Prize in 2009. And since 2009, because she figured the prize and then do something new big, uh, she's been building Chicana for Mirasa, a digital archive documenting Chicana feminist praxis in the 1970s. And so that project and her thinking about it and how it's changed the way that she thinks about archives after working in archives is going to be the heart of her presentation tonight. I want to also mention this is part of the Paul F. Lazarus Fell Lecture Series. We're grateful for that support. Um, and I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet if you're not on our mailing list and would like to be. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over and welcome again Maria. Thank you. I, really, I want to thank Amy for forcing me to think more seriously about my oral history methodology, which like many oral historians, I had just launched, you know, out of necessity and desperation and with a sense of urgency that the stories were being lost is the classic oral history story, right? The story of oral history. Right? Because I wanted to elaborate a history from the bottom up, a history from below of Chicana feminism in the 60s and 70s. Um, why I felt such urgency um, is, I think, from first being narrated in uh, a kind of urgency as a scholar, right? I, I was extremely frustrated with the materials, and a, a teacher, I was extremely frustrated with the materials that I had to teach with when teaching about, on the one hand, the Latinos in the civil rights era, on the other hand, uh, because I'm, I'm jointly appointed in Latino studies and women's studies. On the other hand, sort of the second wave of the women's movement and all of the anthologies and all of the and, and much of the scholarship, I wasn't seeing uh, work about Chicanas, women who identified as both feminist and as a, a Chicano or Latina, because we also interview Latinas. And so this sort of story in my mind was getting lost, right, between this, uh, or within and between this binary, right, between a kind of male-centered discourse around uh, uh, Chicano, the Chicano movement that really focuses on kind of this militarized um, man recuperating his masculinity uh, from white colonial, the white colonizer, um, and this sort of white woman-centered narrative of women who are sort of, uh, you know, this is the classic scene from Atlantic City uh, from the Miss America contest, or contest, is that what they call them that? <laughs> conference? How do you call it the Miss America conference? <laughs> Thank you very much. Not a contest, but a pageant. Um, where the famous scene where they're playing, right, the bras and makeup and everything. This is a, a really kind of iconic photo. But between these two iconic photos, what happens for example, in the kitchen of the soup kitchen that the Brown Berets established, or actually the women in the Brown Berets established, that story 
gets lost. There's also a more permanent, uh, personal sort of origin story to this project. And the reason I knew that that story was getting lost, and the reason I even knew that there was a story to be told, was because my mother was a central part of it. Um, in 1970, all right, but not there. What about those arrows in the middle? All right. All right. So the project we've been developing over the last 10 years is called Chicana Con Mi Plaza. And the title actually comes from a poster that my mother gave me many years ago. And it was a poster that was uh, silkscreened for her in the very first action that she took with other Chicanas in 1970, which was an action against police brutality in South Texas. Um, and she gave me this when I started graduate school, I think, and it became the name of our project. The aim of the project is to collect and preserve the history of Chicago from the 1960s, 70s, and it's actually increased in scope to the 80s and the early 90s. Um, a central element of it is collaboration, various kinds of collaboration, collaboration with uh, the people we interview, but also collaboration with other scholars, with librarians, with uh, digital infrastructure specialists, um, and there's a pedagogical, a really important pedagogical aspect to this. So it's all kind of knit together. I'm going to talk a little bit about how that is. So the primary aim of the project is to collect oral histories. Um, but what we, and that's how we started. We were going to collect the stories of women who had been active um, across and between movements in the 1960s. Our scope was pretty broad in the beginning. We started with, you might call it a snowball sample, but if there are any soci sociologists in the room or social scientists, uh, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> but we really started with my mother's network, right? So we started in Texas, we branched out into California, and we also started with Linda's uh, mother's <laughs> networks in Chicago and Wisconsin. And we started in that kind of intimate space of people who knew um, our mothers. And that is one of the ways in which we got access to a lot of the women that we were interviewing. Since that time, the project has expanded, um, and we have around 150 oral histories. Um, again, we, uh, given the limited funds that we have, um, we do oral histories usually in one to two days. Ideally, you want a much longer uh, series of interviews, but that's the time that we have. And what we realized when we arrived at some of these women's homes is like our mother's homes, they were filled with our so very quickly we realized this wasn't just going to be a oral history project, but we were going to be scanning and digitizing um, archival collections in women's homes as well. Um, the digital collection that we have, as I said, includes oral history clips um, and archival documents. We have all kinds of archival documents. Uh, we have multi-page newspapers, radical movement newspapers. We have photographs. We have letters and correspondence. We have um, short films, uh, you know, basically it's a multimedia archive. And it's organized on this digital platform that was actually created for the natural sciences um, through a multi-university project that was about a $4 million grant created to uh, enable scholars across the globe to um, environmental science, scientists in particular uh, to share research, to share images, to share data, et cetera. So it's a kind of massive data management and sharing platform um, that is login based. So all you need is a login to get in there. Again, you can access uh, the archives. And at the end of the talk, if anyone wants to see it, I can show you what that looks like. Right now, there's around 7,000 uh, digital objects actually available on the data management system. We've got another three to 4,000 that are actively being processed. I'll talk a little bit about how we manage that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this work is intensely collaboration, collaborative. The, the collaborations are large and small. So the collaborations range from my collaboration with Linda, who has videotaped all most of our um, oral history uh, interviews, um, and who's also a scholar in her own right of this period. Um, but we've also developed collaborations with UIUC, the University of uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, their Institute for Computing in the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. They're the first who invited us to try out this data management tool, and then they supported us as we developed the project over the next couple of years. 
Um, the folks who developed, the developers who worked on the tool have also worked with us, some more uh, willingly than others. Uh, there is like the, the big secret in uh, digital uh, humanities is that all the cyber infrastructure specialists tend to be white guys, older, not older, younger white guys. And so we've had a few uh, uh, moments of miscommunication, I'll say. But they, but still, you know, they've enabled those collaborations have really enabled the cyber infrastructure of the project to to move forward. Um, I was telling the class earlier that I I got a space at the University of Michigan um, in their cluster of computers at Advanced Research Computing, which really only uh, scientists use. But we have a little Chicana space on there. They laughed when I said, "You need three terabytes? Is that okay?" That's not very many. That's a in joke. <laughs> digital management. Three terabytes is huge, but to them it's tiny. So, um, but we've also done some interesting collaborations that have launched other projects. And uh, one of those collaborations is with uh, Elena Gutierrez at the University of Illinois, Chicago, who launched a World History and Archive Collection project called Chicana Chicago. Um, another very early partner was uh, Tess Arenas at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who launched a statewide oral history project, and they just published a book on it called Somos Latinas, right? So these are what we call loose collaborations, and what they are is essentially we gave them all of the guidelines that they needed to do a robust digital project, um, from equipment lists to workflows to uh, how to you know fill out just spreadsheet templates, everything, right? Um, and then they give us the materials that they ingest. But those materials also sit in institutions. The, the, the physical materials sit in institutions um, that are regional. So in the Wisconsin Historical Society has all the materials collected by Somos Latinas, but we have the digital objects. So it's a really interesting collaboration in that sense, in that we basically create the infrastructure for these projects to launch so that we can ingest the materials. But we don't, none of the materials that we have in our archive, we actually have in our office, right? So it's an entirely born digital project. Mm -hmm. There's a similar project at Rice University, a little bit different. This uh, was a graduate student who wanted to teach an oral history class. And so we gave her all the things that she needed to do that. She collected three oral histories for us that were incredible and about uh, 800 documents uh, her class did, and we adjusted those into the archive. So the idea here is really about crowdsourcing the archive. We have limited resources, but we do have what we do have is a digital infrastructure, and we have guidelines that we've developed over the years, right? And so we can give these to partner projects so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And what we get in exchange is materials that expand our archive, um, because we can't be everywhere. We can't afford to do all these trips. You know, we do maybe one a year, um, but we have expanded the archive through these important projects. We just launched the Enriqueta Vasquez Digital Oral History, Digital History Project in New Mexico um, that is going to be actually officially launched in January. And that is a statewide uh, digital um, history project. In order to share these materials with the public, so our, our, our platform, our data management platform, is a login-based platform. So scholars who are working on the project, graduate students, undergraduates in some cases who are research assistants, and the women who we interview all have access. They have logins to get into the data management system. It is a closed archive because in our release forms that we sign with women, we, they maintain copyright to all their materials. So if someone wants to use an oral history or an image, um, they have to seek permission from the person who, who donated it to us, right? the person we interviewed. Um, so we hold no rights over the materials. Um, the only rights we have are to, to hold on to the digital copy and keep it in our archive, and then it, use it perhaps in our public website. So because our repository is closed, um, we have created a public website where primarily students um, who are researching in the archive and managing these um, sort of, they might be cataloging a collection, listening to the oral history, they write biographies, um, they can also do essays that are historical essays that aren't linked to a single biography. And then they also catalog or curate um, images from the archive, right? So each biography of the women that are included, that are included in the website um, includes also a selection that the student chooses from her archives. 
So the students are curating and producing historical content. And I'm happy to show you that website uh, when I'm done. Oh, I'm moving right through here. Maybe actually I'll go there now since I have a little time. Okay. So this is our uh, public website. Um, we have some categories up here. Uh, and the credits is essentially these are oral history, these, these are biographies based on um, oral histories and archival collections. And uh, students write these biographies. Um, some do these really nice little flip, these like digital bios. Um, and then these uh, materials have been selected by the student. This is, she had a, uh, Sonia had a really beautiful poster collection. And so I can you know, show you a little bit more about that website if we have some time. So another very important aspect of this project, um, and this, you know, a few uh, students asked me about this earlier, that you know, one of the impetuses behind this project was really to kind of um, try to replicate the initiatives the educational community education initiatives that Chicanas themselves have created. And we're learning more and more about these initiatives every time we interview Chicanas and collected their archive, right? So Chicana Research and Learning Center is just one of those. There are many other sort of educational, community education projects. So one of the things we thought very very early on was, you know, how do we also honor that uh, type of pedagogy and reach out into communities? And one of the ways we've done it is by making strategic partnerships with community advocacy organizations, and also um, at my university with the School of Art and Design. Um, so the School of Art and Design has a class called Designing for Exhibition. And they just do sort of mock uh, e exhibits. And so I approached the teacher who teaches that class, and I said, well, how would they like to do a real exhibit in the community? Um, and so I developed a relationship with her. And out of that relationship came two really amazing exhibits based on the materials that we had collected. The first one, and they're both in Detroit, uh, the first one called La Verdes in 2014 was based on oral histories that my class had collected um, in 2013 with Michigan local activists. Um, and this uh, exhibition was mounted, designed and mounted for an abandoned house um, in Detroit that, that uh, was at the center of the Mexican community. Um, and so we uh, got permission from the owner of the home to, to mount the exhibit in the home and have like a, a nice pop up for, a, a, it was up for about six weeks. It was um, an abandoned home. Yes, it was a home actually used by a social service uh, advocacy agency and they had just moved out. So it was not completely abandoned, it was still functional, which is unusual in Detroit at that time, it was 2014, right? So it still had pipes, which is great. Um, and 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 the lights were still on, so so this was key. And they were moving out and leaving. So we, in in exchange for repainting the whole downstairs, yeah, this is the kind of stuff we do. Uh, we repainted the whole downstairs so they could be rented out, and then they let us uh, mount this exhibit and and um, and basically. Uh, you want the exhibit to the community? Yeah, and and we did the it, with this other exhibit, which just happened last year. Chicana Fotos, we had interviewed a filmmaker um, and we did not know that she was a photographer in the 70s and she had something like 2,800 um, images and negatives of, of like uh, farm worker boycott, uh, active movement activities in Chicago, um, all kinds of stuff, right? Beautiful photos. Um, and so we partnered with the class again and had them curate, really I did mostly curate, but they designed a fantastic show um, that was at Wayne State and the Ruther Library. And the interesting thing about this collaboration, like it was multi-tiered, so she had all of these incredible pictures of United Farm Worker activities in Chicago. The Ruther Library had a massive collection of materials on the Midwestern uh, activities of the United Farm Workers. So we had students go in and match the photos to the documents. Right, so if there was a newspaper article that said more about the photo 
um, then, or you know, that or the photo somehow illuminated a document. Then we put those together in the exhibit. So the students actually um, basically kind of reunited these two disparate, these two dispersed archives, but that kind of illuminated each other in really interesting ways. So that partnership was with the School of Art and Design and the Walter P. Luther Library, and they lent us their materials. They allowed us to scan their materials so we could show the two side by side. So I've talked a little bit about this, but this is really uh, one of the most um, important aspects of the project. Um, I've written a little bit about that kind of intimacy of the oral history and archive collection, the archival collection moment, right? So we go into women's homes, we listen to them, we have coffee with them, we, you know, we stay up late with them, we're scanning their archives. A small part of that is the oral history. Right? Because if you, if anyone has done interviews with older people, you realize you know you, you, you basically have them for an hour and a half, right? So we, you know, a, a small part of those activities is the actual oral history, but we spend up to 12 hours in some of these homes, right? Um, and so that sort of um, deep engagement, right, is what I call the archive of encuentro. That's what I mean when I talk about um, in my writing about this project. You know, how do we move from a static repository to a live archive, right? And it's this act of encounter and engagement that's transgenerational, where knowledge is being passed down to a new generation. Um, there are three generations in these spaces. There's the elders, the mujeres, we call them veteranas, veterans of the social movements. There's me, their daughter. <laughs> I stand in for their daughter. I'm just going to put it out there, right? <laughs> and then there's the students that we work with. Right, so what is being enacted in that space is this kind of transit of knowledge, right, that's multi-generational. And that is why it's not just that student labor is free, although I'll admit that's how it started. Um, it's that in the moment of, of activating that archive of Encuentro in those spaces, we realized very quickly that having students there had carried a, a deeper meaning for the women with whom we were engaging than just having us there. Um, and so I just wanted to show a few images, and most of these include students uh, working on the project. Most of these students um, sorry, are University of Michigan students, but not all. When we went to interview Alicia Escalante, I found out that there was a, a, a master's student um, at uh, UC, uh, sorry, Cal State LA, who was writing a master's thesis. And I learned this from one of my colleagues. And I said, well, I want her to come to the interview. So she came to the interview, um, interviewed, uh, asked some follow-up questions of Alicia Escalante, who was a welfare rights organizer, um, and then ended up later getting into a doctoral program at Santa Barbara and writing a dissertation on her. Um, uh, this is one of our undergraduates scanning buttons at Yolanda Lanisa's home in LA, who is a member of Radical Women. Right, uh, socialist feminist organization. <laughs> um, this is two in the morning with Ana Nieto Gomez looking at a newspaper after she bought me great, some great uh, carnitas. <laughs> There's a lot of eating that goes on. Yeah. Um, this is also in LA uh, looking at photos uh, from Corinne Sanchez, a member of La Tica Sepultemo. This is Yoli Alaniz, who runs the Radical Women House in LA. There's my mother behind. We took my mother. My mother was like a, you know, I often told her she's like to, she, you know how they put donkeys in barns <laughs> to calm the other animals? I don't know. If I, know that. I don't know why I know this, but I do. And I was like, you like our donkey, mom. So she was like, we took her on these, some of these early trips because the minute she walked in the door, the memory started pouring out. Almost all the women that we interviewed, whether they knew her or not, had seen her speak at a conference or had read her book. It's the first book on Chicana feminist history. Right? Um, and that's also a great example of the spaces in which these archives ex exist. This is her garage. Um, Dorinda Moreno, the poet. These are some of my students in Chicago um, having dinner, uh, having brunch with some of the women we interviewed. Maria Varela, a member of SNCC, the nonviolent Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, who later went on to work for land rights in New Mexico. Um, this is a group of elders 
uh, and members of our advisory board. So the women that the elder, the, some of the elders that we interviewed in the first pass became members of our advisory board. This is the, also the model for the Somos Latinas project. This is Betita Martinez, called the lion of the uh, civil rights movement. Um, she also worked for SNCC and the Black Panthers and then ended up publishing a Lito newspaper in New Mexico to document, document the land rights struggles. And this is us in her backyard. She actually got that necklace off of me because she kept complimenting me. So I finally had to just give it to her. I love that necklace. Um, and this is a story I love to tell. I'm just going to tell this archive story and another one. I'm still doing good. Yeah, I have time for a few archive stories. So this is our first trip. This is my mother's archive. And you can recognize her altar that I showed you in the beginning right here. Um, this is her organized archive. She has a whole disorganized archive in her other office. Um, this is Adonia Artiaga, one of the first students to work on the project. Um, she and Carolyn Racine, uh, who's a nice uh, sort of Michigan farm girl from uh, Adrian, Michigan, um, had never been out of the state, neither of them. And I took them with me to California, uh, sorry, to, to Texas. And their mothers were very concerned when they dropped them off. And I said, it's fine, nothing will happen. We're staying in my mother's house. Um, and so this is when we first arrived. And uh, you know we're in Austin, and there's a lot to do in Austin. And I kept going out every night, but they refused. <laughs> and I would come home, and they'd still be looking at archives. And I'd be like, you guys, you, guys, you can't, you know, you, you've got to find some time for yourself here in Austin. <laughs> And finally, on the last night they were there, I forced them to leave the house at five. And I was like, you are not working. We're leaving tomorrow. You have to go out and enjoy some of this nightlife. And they were out till two and came home. To me, this is like the, it was the first archival trip. The first <laughs> I felt very bad that I was returning their daughter. <laughs> but I want to point out something really interesting here. So, you know, uh, Carolyn, uh, who was tattoo free until this moment, got this huge tattoo, like it's this big on her side. Uh, and some of you who are familiar with the iconography of the 1960s will recognize this image. It's a classic image of the Indo-Chinese woman, the Vietnamese woman, warrior, with the baby, um, usually with the baby in her arms and a gun slung across her back. It was very ubiquitous in a lot of militant newspapers, right? And the girls, the young women had found these images, right? Um, and asked, had Xeroxed them and, asked, and took them into the, to the tattoo parlor and asked to have them put on their bodies permanently. Um, but what is interesting about this image is that the woman is not holding a baby as in the original image. She's holding a sheaf of wheat. And so Carolyn is like a radical farmer. And so for her, she you know, substitutes this one image of fertility with another one. So all I want to point out about this is that for them, the archive is not a static object, right? What it mobilizes is liberatory and revolutionary um, imaginaries for them. And so that was sort of something, oh, come <laughs> Right when I was talking about liberatory imaginaries, <laughs> why didn't you know it? So so, so that that moment when I when I saw that image, I realized that it's not just a nostalgic, right, uh, kind of appropriation of um, past radicalism. Mm. In fact, something else is going on, something extremely powerful in this engagement uh, with the Chicana archive. And you don't need to be a Chicana to experience it, right? Um, So after that experience, I decided that I was going to teach classes using this. And moreover, I was going to design a course that could be portable. In other words, other people could teach it in other contexts. So the idea that I had was to create this class that can be taught in all of these different contexts. And not just for Chicana content, right? So this is the first, oh, that's no good. <laughs> I see. So I hope I'm not making people dizzy. Uh, sorry. Difficulties here. Okay, let's 
let's go here. My mom will say, did you see yourself on Alisa? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You're here. Okay. Let's try this. Um, so that's Latina practices of oral history in which we interview women and the students produce knowledge for the community. So the students presented on uh, the student teams who interviewed different women presented on those women. Um, and here we are in their homes with my students in these classes. It's a class I've taught twice, but the more important thing about this is it's a class that they've bundled into kind of a teaching package um, to assist other people who feel like teaching this material. And again, the material is not necessarily, um, it, it is something that's portable to other community experiences. So my dream is, right, that we have a kind of package of materials all set up uh, for people who want to teach about other kinds of community histories, um, but they can use the same materials to do it. And here are some of the classes that have been taught uh, using this method. Okay, so that's my overview of the project, and I want to finish up with something I been thinking a lot about I'm, I'm working on a book right now about the project and one of the things that I've been wrestling with is how to not do what I said I didn't want to do in other words I don't want to write a history of Chicano feminism because that seems wrong or antithetical in some way to the spirit of the project so I've been thinking a lot about autoethnography and about how you uh, write an autoethnographic history right of Chicano feminism and so I, I this uh, opportunity to contemplate my own oral history methodology, such as it is, um, has uh, sort of spurred me on to think about it a little bit more deeply and to write about it. So I'm going to just read these few pages if you don't mind. So what I hope that I've demonstrated is that, yes, is that the Chicana Formidasa Digital Memory Project is more than simply a collection. It really is a collective, and it's animated by a shared desire to preserve memory but also to imagine a different kind of knowledge praxis, one that centers an intersubjective and collaborative approach to knowledge making that fundamentally, in my mind, transforms the archive from a static repository into an encuentro, an encounter with the past. While many aspects of the project nurture this sense of archive as encuentro, from the involvement of students in nearly all of our collection and preservation processes to the ways in which we've shared our materials, materials with the public, both online and through community-based partner projects, um, to our extended uh, collaborations with scholars and indeed the women themselves. It is uh, despite all of these things, right, that make this, uh, or that move the archive from a static repository into an encuentro, a space of encuentro, Really, it is in the intimate spaces of memory exchange where the present and the past meet that the sense of building knowledge together is most profoundly activated. And so to illustrate this um, and what it might mean for a practice of oral history in the present and into the future, I'd like to share a little archive story. So this past summer, uh, I took a research trip to Milwaukee, Wisconsin with two undergraduate interns. Annalisa Ruiz, who is here, and a student um, at Barnard, uh, and Sonia Olmos, a student at Cal State Monterey Bay. They came from either side of the continent <laughs> and met in Michigan to work with me. Gosh, they didn't know what they were getting into. So we went to Milwaukee uh, to conduct interviews with several women who had been active in the Latina task force. And oh, this is Sonia, and this is Annalisa. She had different color hair then. <laughs> Oh, and here we are with archives sitting on the porch, <laughs> waiting to return them to someone who had kindly lent them to us but wasn't home. It was actually your sister's house. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so we were there to conduct interviews with several women uh, who were active in um, the Latina Task Force, which was a group formed in the mid-1980s as a res uh, response to the continued marginalization of Latina issues in both Latino-led organizations and white women's organizations in the state. Um, and this is Eloisa Gomez with whom we conducted the interview. Um, as is the norm for such research trips, I had rented a house where we could be comfortable, a place where we could look, where we could cook, where we could host the veteranas, the women that we interviewed, and really spread out to work on processing archival documents, which we did. We were spread out across a huge table. On our four, first morning in Milwaukee, Annalisa went out for a walk and brought home some pan dulce from a Mexican bakery. 
sand that she discovered at the farmer's market. And we couldn't help but notice that one of the items she chose, a luscious concha style sweetbread, and you saw examples of these out there, looked uh, suspiciously maternal, for lack of a better word. <laughs> uh, this is not the actual sweetbread, but it is an example of what she chose. <laughs> We came to call this piece of bread the boob concha. <laughs> and it lingered in our kitchen for the duration of the trip, none daring to bite into it because of the almost totemic aspect it took on over the days that we spent listening to stories, scanning documents. Indeed, even as we were, we forced ourselves to slice it into three parts <laughs> and share it as our final meal in the house before returning to Ann Arbor, we sensed only half ironically that it held some kind of larger significant significance for our work. In many ways, the symbolism is obvious. We'd spent three days listening to stories from Wisconsin veteranas, Tess Arenas, and Elisa Gomez, looking at documentary evidence of their work from newsletters to conference proposals to more intimate evidence of their complex, the complex texture of their lives, family photos, a handwritten poem to a distant grandparent, obituaries, sly yearbook messages. We'd spent days and nights talking about the past and the present, and as almost always is the case, the future, over mole and cafe, and occasionally a glass of wine, but not the students. Just me. <laughs> we had been immersed in a living archive of Encuentro, engulfed in the stories, nourished by memories, and what better image for what we had experienced in Pan Dulce, which has connotations for so many of us of the domestic warmth of the kitchen with its cafecito, its smells of past and future meals, its cheese classic heard among the glad clattering dishes. This is the prototypical scene of our systems of transgenerational Chicana knowledge exchange. Sonia, my student, captured these resonances beautifully in her reflection essay about researching the Latina task force, in which she makes explicit the connections between our encuentro with the Chicana past and the knowledge systems that she participated in as a child. I remember experiencing how the senoras in my family would gather around a circle during family events as a way of claiming territory in a public space donde ellas manda, where they uh, ruled. If children were given access to enter into their space, their role was to listen and observe while they led the discussions. Interruptions from outsiders were prohibited and viewed as disrespectful. Las senoras collectively created a space of healing, support, and empowerment because allí todas eran hermanas y comadres, pero también unas chismosas, because there they were all sisters and comrades um, or friends, um, but also very gossipy. For me, hearing the stories of the Latina task force was like listening attentively to las señoras from my family, because they showed how chismear can be a feminista praxis to create social change. Por andar de chismosas, which is kind of a saying in Spanish, these mujeres who are mostly in their 20s and 30s and identify as first generation low income or children of migrants would voluntarily get together after work on the south side of Milwaukee during the early 1980s to recreate a ritual of circle gathering like the ones Las Señoras would practice. Examining the Latina task force through the prism of the circles of gathering in her mother's kitchen, Sonia transforms two paths simultaneously She's able to see the gossip of the señoras, the chisme, as something more than mere gossip, and the consciousness-raising work of the Latina task force as part of a much longer tradition of women who create spaces of freedom within the constructs of hetero heteropatriarchal culture, the spaces where they could flourish, as Sonia puts it, into mujeres chingonas. But another more personal kind of transformation is implied in this encuentro with the past, one that illuminates the intersubjective memory praxis at the heart of the Chicana por mi casa project. For in collapsing the space between her mother's kitchen and the Latina task force, Sonia also makes a critical connection between her role as a, a, as a critical witness in our interviews and her childhood memories of listening to las señoras as they swap stories, chismes, and crafted circles of gathering where knowledge could be exchanged and transmitted to the next generation. So Sonia's memory work 
thus points us to some key methodological propositions that are not unique to our approach to oral history, but are nevertheless central to its articulation as a practice of community building through archival encuentro. From its emergence as a scholarly and popular practice of historical inquiry, oral history has provided a key avenue for making visible the experiences of historical actors who, regardless of their impact on the course of world affairs, have too often been left out of dominant historical accounts. But given the deep connections between the methods developed by oral historians, which center on the interview as a key source of um, knowledge, and the ethnographic enterprise, with its methodological focus on participant observation, questions about the intersubjectivity of knowledge production have always haunted the practice of oral history. These questions emerged with particular acuity and force in the 1970s as feminist scholars embraced oral history as a key avenue for uncovering the largely hidden experiences of women. For example, in her 1977 essay, What's So Special About Women, um, Sherma Gluck envisioned women's oral history as a necessarily feminist encounter that validated women's experiences, created lines of communication among women of different generations, and allowed for the discovery of our own roots and the development of a continuity which has been denied us in traditional historical accounts. And you can see that uh, sort of our approach to the ethnographic or the oral history encounter um, in our project does all of these things, right? But for all its potential, feminist oral historians have not been blind to the power relations embedded in this scene of feminist encounter. And indeed, many have wrestled openly with their roles as interpreters of women's words and offered cautionary tales of their failures to disrupt the social relations of knowledge production notwithstanding their efforts to create more equitable models of feminist research. Feminist oral historians and inform, uh, have rightly pointed out how naive assumptions of feminist sisterhood between scholars and informants or narrators only exacerbate the inherent contradictions at the heart of a feminist interviewing scene. Of course, the Chicana por mi casa project is not immune to the power dilemmas that arise in the intersubjective practice of oral history. But one of the reasons these contradictions haven't felt quite so nagging, haven't actually stopped us from doing the work, is that in our approach to interviews, we perhaps unconsciously have returned home, as Sonia suggests, embracing our own familial frame for understanding the scene of encounter. And we are not alone in this. In their essay, Vamos a Platicar, Dolores Delgado, Bernal, and Cindy Fierro propose an approach to interviews that is informed by the informal platicas with grandmas, parents, and other adults that they experienced in their households. Delgado Bernal notes that through these platicas, she received crucial family cultural knowledge while growing up, information about who she was, where she was from, and how to be with others. For her and for Fierro, Platicas are not just casual conversations around the kitchen table. They are a form of epistemology from below, in that they allow participants to, quote, witness shared memories, experiences, stories, ambiguities, and interpretations, and thus impart them with the knowledge connected to personal, familial, and cultural history. Drawing from these experiences or organic knowledge exchange, Delgado Bernal and Pierro outline a platica methodology of data collection and interpretation that is grounded in alternative ways of knowing. And I just, they outline five principles, and I think we can think back on what I just talked about with the project, and you can see how just in discovering this oral history essay for this talk, I in a way just recognized what we were doing in our project. So the five principles of Platica are the research is grounded itself in Chicana Latina feminist history, or theory. Right, so it's not just it's the practices, the methodology, but also the interpretive scope, like how we interpret what we've learned from these oral histories. Um, all the participants are co-constructors of knowledge. Right, we don't take the knowledge that they give us and create something through our interpretive, interpretive optic. Right, we are co-creating knowledge. Um, this uh, methodology places lived experience at the center, and mujeres guide the conversation, not the other way around. So we leave our questions very open-ended. Um, and in fact, uh, Mujeres tend to, uh, Annalisa has been a part of one of these, really the conversation. I remember one mujer, uh, a farm worker woman from um, uh, Southern California, 
when her friend was afraid to do an interview right after she'd done one, she said, Ay, nomás agarras el rollo y te vas, which means you grab the roll and you go. <laughs> it doesn't really translate. But she was like, you know, just start talking, right? And that's because we don't interrupt. And we don't ask questions that we think we need to cover, right? They just, these are really life histories. Um, this idea that, that this interchange provides a potential space for healing, it has been our, our experience this is in fact the case. Many women have experienced trauma um, in, their, in their work in the movement years. Um, and sharing their stories has been a space of healing for them. And finally, it relies on relations of reciprocity and vulnerability and researcher reflexivity. The space that we create with our platicas requires that we too be open sharing our own stories and be as vulnerable as we are asking our contributors to be. <coughs> so our platica methodology is enacted in both the way we approach the oral history interview as a free-flowing intergenerational exchange between mujeres but also in the horizontal relations of knowledge production of the project as, as a whole. But it's also enacted in those more intimate spaces that so often get left out of published historical accounts. In the stories of past and present struggles we listen to while leafing through photo albums, scanning countless letters, proposals, and periodicals. It shapes the hours spent in spare rooms, attics, basements, garages, and outbuildings, finding long forgotten items shoved into the corners of offices our platicas have extended over countless meals, cafecitos, and gin and tonics, where we live the archive as an encuentro between the present and the past in an effort to build a future that includes Chicanas in its collective memory. It's enacted in the, oh, in the process that Chicana por Mendoza Digital Memory Project has evolved into something more than what we originally imagined it to be. In building this digital collection, of documents and oral history recordings, we have also built a collective, a circle of gathering, where veteranas, scholars, students, and community members come together to create new histories and imagine new ways of knowing that interrupt dominant left scripts about our past, present, and future. And in this sense, the Chicana Comita says, not unlike the unruly collection in my mother's home, not only documenting, but also enacting, calling forth her call for Chicano, Chicanas to take control of the means of knowledge production. It deploys a praxis of Chicana feminist knowledge that speaks beyond the confines of the university to rest the definition of what we are from the various histories and histories that have only marginally incorporated us. Thank you. Just 
going to end up in some book of oral history, or, you know, something somewhere that they will never have access to. They feel more, I think, invested and trust, trustful. That's not a word, but trustful. Yeah, I just made it a word. Um, what that means is that they need to be protected, right? So the, the digital um, collection uh, is full-size files. It's a multimedia collection, which is to say that, you know, if you wanted to download an image from that collection, you could publish it in a book or in a, put it in a film, right, without attributing or requesting permission, right? Um, and so that, because that's the case, because these are full-size files, um, we need to ensure that they're not used in ways that the women themselves don't want them to be used. And so that's kind of the, 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 the way we sort of address issues of access is by the creation of you know, these multiple access points from like pop-up exhibits to the website, which is not comprehensive. It's just a small selection, it's very curated. Um, but many people have come to the collection through the website and have requested to look at materials. And we do allow teachers to, to have um, viewer access to the collection to use in their teaching. Um, and viewer access basically allows individuals to look at the images and also download them, so there's a risk, but not to change the metadata or do anything um, catastrophic. So you copyright all the all or some of the materials, and if, if so, you budget for that, or what is oh, the no, cost? We, so we do not copyright. We uh, in our release forms, we uh, the we just indicate that women hold the copyright. That doesn't mean that they're actually submitted for copyright. It's just that if someone wishes to use those materials in whatever form they wish to use them, they they we can put them in touch with the women, and the women determine uh, how they will. But that doesn't keep them from just taking the material. No. It's an auto system. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like that, in that way, it's not like a physical library, right, or an archive, which can have, you know, some pretty strict controls over how materials are, are accessed and, and reproduced, right? So if someone really, you know, wants to use the materials, it's, it is, it's the honor system. Most of the scholars that we work with and people who use the collection, um, are very invested in maintaining good relationships with the collection and with the women on the So that's kind of Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for a beautiful talk and for giving us so much to think about as far as um, that female intimacies as catalysts for memory and history. Um, I really appreciated it. My question is kind of a curiosity question, but, but I think goes along the lines of what we've heard and we've been talking about. I'm curious about afterlives and not so much digital afterlives, but human afterlives and physical afterlives. So um, I'm curious about whether or not any of these women have since passed away and how your plans are to negotiate permissions and copyrights and stewardship yes. of information after somebody's not able to give permission? So this, is a, this is one of the questions that kind of keeps me up at night, actually, to tell you the truth, because it's not just, I mean, I think it is connected to the digital afterlife, too. Yeah. Right, because we um, are not funded by the NEH or Malin Brown or the IMLS. We have, as I was joking with the class earlier, um, to quote Fred Merton and Stefan Harney, we we're basically thieving cyber the cyber infrastructure from the institution, right, to do a project that is not institutional based. We don't have a partnership with the library, for example. So, um, is it something you're interested in looking for, or not? Not so much, and there's reasons for that, and you know, I won't necessarily get into it. Of necessity, 
we have launched as an autonomous project. And that is actually what I, why I ended with this slide, right? Because these, uh, you know, I'm really interested in thinking about autonomous knowledge projects and their limits, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, so so this idea of the first of all, I should say, thankfully, none of the women that we have interviewed have, as that's not true, one has passed away from cancer. Um, we did not collect from archive because we were going to return to digitize from archive. Um, but we did get an interview with her. Um, the, so, so we have addressed this in a kind of catch as catch can way. Mm -hmm. So her daughter, for example, is a, is a good friend of mine. So there's just an understanding, right, that her daughter will manage and has been managing actually her archive and, and, and will continue to do so. Um, but I think this is one of the things that we have not really gotten to um, because we've been so focused on collecting. But believe me, Deaf haunts this project uh, in the most real way because we have we are interviewing women who are currently between the ages of 70 and 90. The woman we just interviewed, who by the way I did want to credit, oh please, I'll go back. Uh, but Enriqueta Vasquez, you know, who um, is in the sort of opening slide picture and whose painting appears uh, in in that uh, slide on. on Sonia's quote, um, she's 88, and she lives in a tiny little adobe house in very rural the hills of northern New Mexico. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we we're launching currently, and we'll be seeking institutional funding for the Enriqueta Vasquez Digital History Project, because she has um, a really massive archive, mm -hmm. and uh, is, um, and it's an archive that is like she went to Cuba, she published a radical newspaper. I mean, it's, she has the full run of the radical newspaper. We photographed a 2,000 photographs of that newspaper to re-stitch it together. So like the, we, for that reason, we, uh, we've been working, collaborating with local um, scholars and a scholar from California to launch this uh, the Vasquez Digital History Project. And that one will, you know, will participate in, but, but we're hoping that the library gets invested in that for that reason. So it, we're not against libraries, it's just that for this particular, for our project, we have to make I'm curious about your selection process, how you go about choosing or concern to let this lucidity yeah. Uh, but also the mundane and the dramatic. Say again? The mundane and the dramatic. Of uh, how we engage with that in the, uh, yeah, you choose. just described every single trip. <laughs> <laughs> There's mundanity, drama, yeah. <laughs> varying lucidities, usually on my part, uh, <laughs> students or other but, Particularly with your elders, though. Well, okay, so I mean, a good example of this is by the time we interviewed Benita Martinez, who is considered, she is really, of all the Chicanas we've interviewed, the, probably the most famous of the Chicanas. She also uh, collaborated in publishing this newspaper that we scanned there recently. Um, she had already, her memory was already going. Um, and so when we interviewed her, I had the interesting, you know, I knew her bio front and back. So I kept saying, well, you organized with SNCC in New York. She's like, I did? Mm How -hmm. oh, interesting. Oh. <laughs> she was really interested Show me more. in all of the things she did. And I was like, okay. Sad. Sad. Yeah, no, it's sad because it's a huge repository. Luckily, she has a pretty massive uh, print um, collection. And in fact, we didn't have time to scan her archive, but I will arrange for it to be. Um, but for the video process of yeah. that, not easy. I mean, to, no. get, to keep the needle yeah. thread. Yeah, yeah, it was difficult. But also, but I will say that in, in her case, she, she lived in, uh, in Berkeley. She had a, a just a huge uh, archive in her garage. Um, that and included her interviews. And included, it included, she wrote multiple books. I mean, it was just massive. And we were able, luckily, to put her in touch with Stanford Libraries 
and just make sure that that archive is going to be preserved. And we did that before we scanned it. And usually we want to scan <laughs> archives before we get them to libraries because libraries will not let us scan them once they go in. And we discovered um, after we arranged to have it appraised, after we got it moved into the library, <coughs> you know, 10 years later, they haven't cataloged it. They haven't cataloged it. So I'm, you know, so again, you know, so I often think about this project, because I did write about the 20s and 30s and, um, and some, you know, folklore and oral history projects into the 40s and how, you know, there was a desperation and urgency at that time to collect as much as could be collected, right? Because memories were passing and uh, artifacts were, were disappearing. And so I think we're kind of, for us in our project, that that's what we've been doing. We've really been focusing on collecting and you know, kind of putting our ducks in a row as much as we can, mm -hmm. right? But it's not always possible to, uh, to adequately uh, uh, deal with some of these issues. And frankly, because they are my mother's generation, I think maybe mm -hmm. one of the reasons I haven't been dealing with it is I don't want to think about that. Yeah. Like, and that's another part of the intimacy and affect that may be a not so constructive part. Um, thank you. We're just about out of time, so thank you so much. Mexican muralists. Oh it's God. free and it's only till the 22nd. They must see it. Mm, Mexican muralists. At the Lehman uh, College Art Gallery. Yes. The